Muchas gracias. Eh... Thank you. It is a true pleasure to introduce one of our elders. That's what we would call him if we were in an indigenous community. And I think we are part of a community and the elders are there to be respected and to learn from them. It is an honor, a blessing for us to have with us one of our wise abuelos, one of our wise elders. All those of us who've had some contact with Claudio at a point in our life, we all have our own story. I don't want to steal any of your time, but I want to share with you my story. When I was very young, I was full of enthusiasm. I still am. I was going to start a study with DMA for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder for women who had been sexually abused. It was study funded by MAPS. When I was preparing the study, Claudio Naranjo came to Madrid and I was fortunate to, together with my whole team, we spent a whole day with him. And he told us about his work with MDMA. It might not be something which is well known because uh, Claudio has done a lot of work with psychoactive substances, but MDMA and ayahuasca in particular, in fact, one of his books, which I was lucky enough to present a few years ago in Granollers, Ayahuasca, the vine from the celestial river that is one of uh, uh, Claudio's gift to us. So without further ado, Claudio, thank you and welcome. <coughs> I wasn't planning to be here, wasn't planning to come to this conference because I'm running out of fuel. You know, a new organ is failing every few months, so I'm kind of feeling that I should probably stop walking around the world, doing so many things, working, writing, talking to different groups. So I thought I would retreat, you know, like the Hindus. They have this time of their lives for learning, a time for serving, and a time to prepare for dying. And they take that really seriously. And sometimes they take, they reserve, they, they put aside many years for that last stage because it is said in Eastern culture sometimes that the day of your death is the most important day of your life. It is a gateway you need to know how to cross. So that was my mood because uh, my uh, mobility is failing, not only walking but also when I'm uh, sitting down uh, for a long time, you know, everything starts to fail. Also my voice, you know, it has to do with my Parkinson's. And uh, I thought the message of life was uh, stop it. But they insisted so much that I ended up coming with the feeling that this might be my last conference. You never know, but that's my current mood. So, maybe because of this uh, significant occasion, I chose a significant topic, the relevant of ayahuasca, for the problems of the world. We know what's the purpose, what's the use of ayahuasca for people, for communities, but uh, maybe the community of the world needs ayahuasca as well. Maybe society can be fixed and ayahuasca is a tool for fixing it. That's a topic I chose and I guess I don't need to explain here, there is a problem in the world. The problem is everywhere. And 
I was part of something called the uh, Rome Club. It still exists. I was part of the American branch. And it was the first institution, this uh, club of Rome, to deal with uh, world problems. But that's uh, how we would call it, uh, the world problematic. And uh, this problematic was uh, understood to be a set of aspects within a complex reality seemingly independent aspects where when you try to fix something you unfix something else and when I was uh, when I, I would attend to the meetings of these association I felt something was lacking the uh, attitude was too engineering based to specific uh, the, about uh, financial players and uh, productive players uh, but where where's the human factor here so not so long ago i published this book on the ignored root of our of all our evils of all our problems. It's like people didn't understand what's the actual gist, what's the uh, core of our problems. Everything else is just, uh, are just symptoms. It's like if we wanted to ignore, like it's uh, not well seen in the academia to even utter this concept. And then there's other concepts that are already obsolete because the first theory of the evil in the world we could say is the original sin you know the evil in the world derives from the uh, sin and the sin is uh, was for the ancient cultures what we would call today the sickness or the disease you can read once and again the history of philosophy and religion and exchange the word sin for a more modern one like lack of mental health, lack of uh, loss of mental health, loss of conscience. So the notion of uh, sin is a little old-fashioned for us probably, but it is interesting the notion of the original sin that was uh, so cultivated by Christianism, the idea of original sin is something underlying like the common root to all other scenes and the text from Genesis where this comes from, from where this comes from is uh, all about symbols and symbols are like dreams they have uh, they are multi-purpose they could mean this or that they could in many things. There's this uh, scene in Genesis in which God was uh, strolling in his garden and he saw Adam and Eva and, and Eve that had covered their, uh, their genitals with vine leaves and he knew, God knew, they had sinned. So it looks like the original sin might have to do with whatever is underneath the vine leaf. But it's never said expressly, explicitly. It looks like you wouldn't say that because they also present the scene of eating the forbidden fruit, the infamous apple. And this would be the scene of wanting to know something that belongs to the gods only, the uh, Definitely the ultimate knowledge of good and evil. That's what Adam and Eve wanted. So these two concepts are mistaken and The knowledge of good and evil has actually been a key concept throughout our history It looks like we declare to ourselves We already know what good and evil are and we have spent our whole lives trying to be good and of course 
not being or trying not to be evil. So we should try and see how this concept fits with uh, sexuality because we are clearly in this civilization, in this culture, actually all the cultures in the civilized world are cultures that have turned against nature. They have turned about, uh, they have turned against the most natural thing within us, which is the principle and the drive for pleasure. We are animals. It's not that we're just animals, but we are also animals. And for a long time, we lived as if we weren't. It is as uh, if we had lived thinking we were angels. It's like in uh, theater, in tragedies, they wouldn't represent people doing certain things, such as eating everything performed in, on the stage was uh, virtuous and uh, hero-like. We would represent ourselves as heroes without realizing, maybe, to what extent we had criminalized the serpent in us, the snake in us, according to the myth in Genesis, the, the serpent is the devil. But in previous myths, the snake is related to nature and to the mother goddess allied with nature. And at some point, we became Homo sapiens, and then Homo sapiens sapiens. And maybe we were a little arrogant, and we uh, stressed that we were men of reason rather than beings capable of love, rather than beings capable of animal wisdom. In the oldest peoples, the pre-civilized peoples, the indigenous peoples, animals are sacred. The soul is an animal one. The, in the Egyptian civilization, the gods have animal heads. Amongst the Babylonians and their massive sculptures, the gods also have animal bodies. So something happened at some point when animals were criminalized. We thought less of them. And same as we mistreated the earth and uh, the plant species and the animals, we have also mistreated our own body and our own nature, particularly our instinctive nature. And we could say this is in the core of the original sin, the idea that we are evil, that because of the mistake Adam, Adam and Eve made by eating the forbidden fruit, because of this unforgiv unforgivable original sin and by disobeying the will of God, all of the descendants of Adam and Eve have to suffer and undergo this uh, punishment, this we are doomed. And the uh, ancient philosophers uh, would think about the great suffering of human beings in order to somehow make up for this massive crime committed by Eve, actually, rather than Adam. Because uh, in the myth, of course, she is the one that offers the infamous fruit. She is a little closer to carnality. Well, this theory of the original sin has some valid things, though, because the evil within us is passed on to generations. William Reitner actually updated the idea of the universal plague but the idea of a genetic 
transmission, the genetic transfer should probably be abandoned. Only strongly orthodox Christians preserve this vision that children have to be baptized to to get them uh, read of the uh, read of the uh, of the devil that lives within them because they belong to this punished human species. The second theory about the gist of the evil in the world is probably the Freudian one. Rather than a precise formulation written in the works of Freud, it's uh, more like the coloring and the nuances in many of his works. It's kind of the backdrop. It's like we are animals in a cage. We are instinctive beings that have created this uh, police-based society to watch that we behave and we, that we did the right thing. Well, surprisingly, Freud got this very ancient Christian idea that we are not good, that we are half good, half evil. So Freud took this idea and he reached the conclusion that because we are only half good, we need judges and prisons and police. We need to to step uh, behind the line, to, 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 not, to not overstep our marks, and uh, we need to be alert to watch for each other. So maybe, no, it's funny that uh, somehow this original sin idea smuggled into Freud's philosophy when he accepted this notion. Although Freud thinks it's tragic that because we are not completely good we need to create a uh, repressive culture and by creating this repressive culture we condemn ourselves to neurotic suffering. There was no way out for this situation in the, to the mind of Freud. Then there's been many terms used when they discuss the uh, problems of the world, like violence, uh, enlightenment, for instance. And in feminism, they started to use the word patriarchy and the uh, Patrick, the patriarchal uh, order. That's what all cultures and all civilizations have uh, applied in different ways. And in our culture, based on the Greeks and Romans, this is summarized in the Patria Potestas law. So the father is the owner of the wife and the children. In many literary works to the times of Shakespeare, the fundamental conflict was that the father wanted to marry his daughter to someone and she had free will and then conflict appeared. It's like there were some uh, order imposed by society that gave this authority to the father. So not only the children had to go through the parents, but there was this ownership relationship between humans. So that implies, uh, that has an implied slavery and uh, this personalization. So this idea of patriarchy was uh, rooted in feminism until in a book called The Grail and the Sword 
it was said that the that patriarchy was the common evil of uh, society that it was not bad just for women but that it was a problem for men alike starting with boys so there is a repressive order in the patriarchal order in which the uh, father somehow gags or muscles the wife the, the woman and uh, he takes or he uh, looks down on her and uh, degrades the, her and uh, disregards women and makes her not hurt and she can be exploited as well the less a person, the less the value of a person, the more they are slaved. And this has been true in many cultures, even a great culture such as the Greek culture disregarded women to such an extent that they preferred homosexual love. Homosexual love is good, but as a cultural thing, having all young boys wanting uh, love affairs with uh, mates of the same sex reveals that women were not considered to be peers and could not be loved deeply to the same extent. And well for a long time I was discussing uh, patriarchy but over time I kind of changed my diagnose, my vision on the problem of the world and today I say that the problem of the world is the patriarchal mind and by that I mean something analog to the uh, patriarchal family. There's two orders of repression in the patriarchal family. The repression ex uh, exercised by the father or the uh, authority on the woman and then there's the authority, the repressive action on the children. These are operations, or uh, these operate in a uh, with a, a different nature, and they uh, are related to our neurobiology because we are somehow three-brained uh, beings. We have this uh, intellectual brain, our grey matter, we have a reptilian brain as they call it sometimes, the metaencephalus, the primal brain that uh, comes from the reptiles and then we have a brain we share with mammals in general. And this mammal brain is the eternal brain because mammals are the real inventors of love. Mammals are the ones that have a mother and it is in mammals where we see this phenomenon that children have a slow development within the womb of the mother, then the, the arms of the mother, always close to the mother, and they take a long time to be uh, autonomous as human beings and uh, they learn from the mother things such as the uh, maternal ability. We learn to be mothers or to be maternal and seeing uh, another self so to speak to be empathetic to the extent we have had a mother as well. There's many studies, famous studies you might know, for instance about raising monkeys with uh, mothers made of wire, maybe with a four on top and uh, with a bottle and there was these monkeys created uh, this monk is raised uh, with uh, with this figure with this uh, unreal mother they wouldn't have this uh, maternal ability when they grew up 
they needed some fur to cling to, this uh, tactile stimulus, this feeling of the presence of something closer to the feeling of, of a mother, they would have these, uh, they would be healthier when they, when they grew up. But I want to linger on that much, but if we have this maternal brain, this more aggressive or predator brain that has uh, definitely prevailed in the development of our patriarchal civilization, a more instrumental brain, we could call it too, and the more loving brain that takes care and that has been uh, covered and overlapped by this patriarchal culture. And then we have this organic brain in the sense that it is loaded with this uh, very conscious criminalization as uh, if we had been lobotomized and we could no longer feel the difference except for probably our friends uh, get bored with us because there's people who you would say are not alive and often the uh, growth process in life is about going from uh, this death in life induced by culture to discovering that life is so much more. So if the problem of the world is that a part of us, a part of our brains, a part of our mind, which is of course related to our brains, if we have uh, become isolated um, beings and we believe that the self is an island within ourselves and we don't relate to this maternal part, this empathetic part, and we ignore particularly our instinctive part, if we are like that, if we are beings living in just the room of the house rather than the whole house, then we can say that there is a repression which is uh, exercised on our intellectual mind, on the paternal part and on the instinctive part. And moving on to ayahuasca, I don't know how many of you have uh, heard about the experiments that were performed in Chile in the 1960s when they gave harmalin to a number of volunteer healthy individuals to, to know what would be the effect of harmalin without knowing anything about the culture. And um, it also called their attention that there were many narratives of uh, indigenous peoples and even uh, travelers and botanists like Kronberg. They would tell stories, uh, explorers and anthropologists but would, would also tell stories and they, how they were so similar in the uh, Ayahuasca communities. Maybe they, they wondered, maybe they, they see so many tigers because they have the cultural expectations. They're going to see tigers and these famous snakes that appear in visions. Maybe it's because that's part of their culture as well. So uh, supposedly the experience of ayahuasca has snakes in it. And it turned out this experiment turned out to be really interesting because people who didn't know anything about that, in the beginning there was a group of 30 people who didn't know anything about the indigenous peoples and they didn't know what they were taking either. They would just take um, just a, a wafer and they would start seeing uh, birds and snakes that uh, typical indigenous images of ayahuasca which uh, are uh, 
depicted in the ceramics of the South American peoples like Chavin. And I wondered, I asked myself at that point if maybe there could be some uh, telepathic operation running there between the cultures and the people I was listening to and I ended up to convince myself that this was something as what I call the archetypical world. It is that this component of the snake, the birds of prey, uh, the vulture and uh, the tigers and so on, these are like different aspects of the mythical dragon and the dragon has a very ambivalent nature. Chinese dragons are good, are strong, are celestial creatures that bless everyone but the Mesopotamic uh, dragons are very dangerous and European dragons are even worse. Uh, so Western dragons, we could say, are those uh, fire-breathing beasts like the ones St. George would fight and kill. They are kind of personifi personifications of the ego, of the self. But it is as if the dragon have both aspects. The uh, treasure that can be found in an uh, evil or degraded way, like a force that wants to eat up everything, like in the Hindu myth, uh, before there was life on earth, the dragon in the sky had it all contained inside and then with its spear, Indra, the uh, king of gods, when he uh, spread the dragon, he made it rain over the earth and the cycle of life started. Oh. I think the most striking phenomenon in ayahuasca is not just the appearance of the animal self, the personification of the primitive, which appears in, in this sort of traditional animals, but uh, it's also there in all sorts of uh, symbols to do with the animal world, spiders or bears. We can all have an animal that we feel closer to, but What's striking about ayahuasca is a change of attitude towards the animal. I don't know whether you know stories such as the ones I heard when I was in Putumayo studying this. Stories of people who come to heal themselves with shamans. People who come from an urban environment or people who used to come because I'm talking about back in the 60s when I was out there the shamans, the shamans used to say that they didn't know as much as their parents used to know and a lot less than their grandparents used to know so they felt they were part of a culture that was disappearing but when they received the people who came to them, white people who came to them from urban environments, they used to tie them to a tree or else in the panic of the vision, they could run away and get lost in the jungle and that could be very dangerous. So some people have had that experience of facing really a appalling, scary threats and they find that in the end the animal turns out not to be the enemy but rather a sacred animal. I got to witness 
something very interesting. Somebody who was well known in the world of the psychedelia in the 60s, Leo Self, I don't know whether you might know him, somebody with whom I trained in psychedelic therapy. When I gave him ayahuasca, but it wasn't really, it was arbalina with a bit of LSD, a little dose of LSD, to, it sort of opens up the visionary potential of arbalina, a bit like DMT usually. So I gave him this combination, this cocktail, and at a certain moment he was thinking of his wife and then he was thinking of a woman with whom he had a conflict and it got transformed into a kind of a personification of evil, this problem woman in his life. And then she got transformed into a huge snake that threatened to eat him up. And I luckily had read some shamanic stories. I told him, would you dare allow yourself to be eaten? Understanding that this was an oneric process, just to see what happens. So he allowed himself to be swollen by this kind of python, and he allowed himself to be digested, and he felt transformed into the snake. And the snake was God itself. Very rarely have I witnessed such a huge transformation in somebody's life as I saw there in a space of about five minutes. And I mention this here because I think it's revealing about the essential potential of ayahuasca to decriminalize it and to make us feel alive. We for us, some animals are terrible animals. But there is the potential of recognizing other types of animality, what is sometimes called a power animal or a sacred animal. I don't think that this is a strange phenomena of ayahuasca but rather one of the pillars of psychotherapy was the Freudian ambition of decriminalizing instincts. It's not usually achieved. Other things are much more easily achieved. The deep of uh, the original sin leaves a really deep imprint in us. So we feel bad because we carry a life of instincts. So it's quite relatively rare to have this phenomenon, which we sometimes see in ayahuasca. One of my first voluntary subjects, a woman, she came across a Siberian tiger, a white tiger, and the tiger now then became her guide. She's now older, she's my age, and, and and she still feels that the tiger is her spiritual guide. What am I? How am I? It says 402, 401, 3. Oh my God, I only have three minutes left. Well, four. Okay. Let's see if in these three minutes I can share with you everything I wanted to. If we reject, if we criminalize our inner snake, our reptilian brain, our instincts, this cannot happen without a profound act of unlove towards ourselves. So this process of reconverting 
a dangerous animal into a sacred animal means that we recover the love for ourselves. We believe we love ourselves. We sometimes think we love ourselves a little bit too much. The Christian culture wants us to make us wants to make us so um, self-sacrificial that it makes us feel that you're being selfish if you insist on your own wishes. In most religions, the concept of self-love has disappeared. Only those who start out on the journey to self-knowledge start to see how much they hate themselves, they despise themselves. We need to wake up to self-knowledge, to realize how appallingly we have steered uh, ourselves, how much we have despised ourselves. Only through self-knowledge do we discover how much we reject ourselves. And when we realize, once we realize that, we can start repairing that, healing that through therapy. When you drink ayahuasca and you reconciliate yourself with the animal, what happens is then that you recover the love for yourself. There's a problem in understanding how Christianity, which was so powerful in the world, and which insisted so much on the commandment of love, as it's called, it hasn't managed to originate, to create a peaceful, kind civilization. Quite the opposite. It is an increasingly violent civilization, and I think this is the key. The mandates, the commandment says, love the other as you love yourself, but it ignores that we don't love ourselves because we've been led to believe that loving yourself is selfish. This is a blind spot in our cultural history that ayahuasca is here to repair without having to undergo long verbal analysis. That's how we can explain the amount of devotion in Iwapa. The love of yourself is the fruit of the tree of love. Sorry, 17 seconds! No, it means you're out of time. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me begin my conclusion. With love, for oneself, there comes devotion and even love for the other. It is impossible to love the other if you're not anchored in the love for yourself. And you cannot love yourself if you have the burden of original sin that makes you feel guilty and full of blame. It might not be a bad thing that I'm running out of time because I was about to start on a harder subject, which is the recovery of intuition. We live in the rational mind. We aspire to understand mysteries. We aspire to knowledge. The psychedelic interest is focused on the irrational mind. But at the moment, the world is ever so scientific. And I think that the psychedelic world is falling in the same sin of arrogance that science has, believing that science is wiser than poetry and myths. Naibunihu. <laughs>
Hua buni hua tu a shutu ti mai ni 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 ambi no kue ni naya naya nut ni naya naya nut nai buni hua buni hua tu a shutu ti mai ni 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 ambi no kue ni naya naya nut ni naya naya Tchau, tchau.